Hello, this is Jeff Scott, your instructor for the online version of 152-157, Website Development, XHTML, CSS, for the fall 2015 semester at Blackhawk Technical College. What I'm going to do with the 14 chapters is for each chapter, I'm going to go over the PowerPoints that the author has provided in one lecture, then in one, two, three, or however many lectures it takes, I'm going to go over the material that's in the chapter. All right? So the PowerPoint lectures will be saved as lecture, and the other material that I go over in the chapter will be saved as lab. All right? Now, a couple things as we start going in here. One of the first things I wanted to mention to you. All right, I wanted to give you a couple URLs here. The first one, if you don't know about this already, is w3schools.com. I'm not even going to go to that thing that's there. There we go. W3schools.com, right here. All right. This is a site that's run by the W3C, which is the World Wide Web Consortium. They're kind of the overseers of most things web. What you have in here are, uh, among other things, if I go to tutorials, you'll notice there's HTML tutorials. There's HTML5 tutorials. There um, are CSS tutorials, JavaScript tutorials, jQuery tutorials, Bootstrap tutorials, PHP tutorials, ASP.NET tutorials, SQL tutorials, many of the things that we have entire classes on at this institution. So if I go over to here, and I type in HTML, you'll notice that there's a whole bunch of stuff here. And notice right away, HTML5 tutorial. All right, this is an excellent place to get started as you're coming in here. Now, there was probably another one, but let me just Google, and I'll Google HTML. There are so many sites, it's just really and truly is incredible. This is the Mozilla site. And what I should start doing is I should start bookmarking these and just provide that for you as well. All right, and there's a lot of good material in here also, but there are just so, so many resources that you have. HTML goodies, I've used that before. HTML dog is a good site. There, Like I said, there are just so many sites that if I do come in here, I think that's just it for HTML, yeah. All right, so this is going to be W3 Schools HTML5 Tutorial. W3 Schools CSS Tutorial. And W3 Schools JavaScript. I think it's just JS, but I'll check real quick. Let's double check and make sure these are CSS and JS good. All right. So that'll at least get you started in here. So let's let's go into the PowerPoints. All right. I'm going to follow along with a book, and if you are going to watch these, my suggestion would be that you have your book with you as well. So here are our objectives. Now, I'm not going to sit there and read every one of these to you. Notice it's kind of a history type of thing, how we got to where we are with the Internet and the World Wide Web. There's also some hardware in here. This is about as hardware-oriented as this program gets is in this chapter. All right? So, really, the Internet is about 25 years old. Kind of the father of the Internet, so to speak, is Tim Berners-Lee. 
He's the person who pretty much developed the World Wide Web. All right? The Internet itself, and again, I'm not going to read all of this stuff in here, but the Internet itself started uh, kind of a little historical perspective as a way for the government, and especially the military, to be able to communicate with educational institutions. All right? And they talk about some of the stuff that's happened in here. The, the World Wide Web, or WWW, as it says, this is the author's definition. It's the graphical user interface to information stored on computers, running web servers connected to the net or Internet. Now, what does that mean? You may have seen stuff like this before, and I, I'm going to draw a picture. It probably is even in the book. But I just wanted to show you a little, a little bit of my rendition. So if we come in here, let's see, if we go over to... There we go, shapes. All right, so if we made a whole bunch of these here, all right, so what is the significance of these? I'm going to show you in just a minute. Don't worry that they're not lined up perfectly. I could care less. If you can imagine that each one of these boxes that you see right here represents just a person sitting at their desktop, all right? So that's what, they, what each one is. It's a person sitting at his or her desktop, all right? And if we come in here and we make another one of these, and I'm going to make this bigger, all right? And I'm not... If you can imagine, so I have to come back in here again, and I'd have to insert, and I'd have to go to shapes, and I'd have to go to arrows, etc., and I'd have to start going like this, and like this. Oops. Etc. If you could imagine what I was doing here was making a line from each one of these machines that you see right here to this big machine. Each one of these machines represents a client. It's a browser. It's a person who's online with his or her tablet or cell phone or desktop or laptop. And let's imagine that each one of them wants to order books for this class. And they want to go out to Amazon to do it. So each one of them types in www.amazon.com. Well, what happens then is they, when they type that in, that address becomes something like http colon slash slash www.amazon.com. And really what happens then is a message, which, which is known as a hypertext transfer protocol request, gets sent to a server someplace. And that HTTP and all that other stuff has got to be reconciled into a series of numbers that the system can understand. Then the system goes and answers back. So it comes back with some kind of a response. All right. So if you can imagine, this represents an HTTP request, and that represents an HTTP response. So it's a request response mechanism. All of these machines are sending HTTP requests to this server. The server is trying to answer each one of those requests and send an HTTP response back to each one of the browsers. All right? Now, again, there's probably a better picture than the one I just showed you, and there'll probably be a better one that's drawn in here shortly. Oh, God. I'm having some problems with this machine. So if you see this, it's great. All right. And it's not in letting me do anything here. All 
All right, I'm going to close a bunch of stuff here, and that'll probably make this run a little bit smoother. Chapter one, it's open. Chapter one. All right, so that's pretty much where we left it off. So let's continue on. There are a lot of different, no one owns the internet directly. Rather, there are different organizations that take responsibility for different parts of the internet. Some of these organizations include the Internet Society, the EIT, IETF, and the IAB. Okay? This is a very interesting statistic right here. Millions of users by geographic area. And if you notice how the numbers have jumped, especially in places like Asia, all right, Africa as well. So if you, you can go out there if you want to http colon slash slash www.internetworldstats.com and find out more. All right, I've already mentioned ICANN's another one of these internet standards organizations. I'm not going to go into them any more than that. Let's talk about the difference between the internet, an intranet, and an extranet. All right, the internet is a series of computers that, are, that have a connection between them or a potential connection between them. An intranet so the internet is private. It can be used by anyone. An intranet is private. As it says, it's contained within an organization or a business and it's used to share information and resources among coworkers. So why am I pausing here to show you this? Well, what I do want to show you here, and hopefully I can do it quickly, is at Blackhawk, for example, I can come in here and I can type inside.blackhawk.edu. And it says the, oh, it's because I spelled it wrong. So I type in inside.blackhawk.edu. I'm in our intranet. So this is all sorts of information that I have available to me now. If I want to try to access the intranet from home, instead of typing in inside.blackhawk.edu, the way that it's set up here is I type in outside.blackhawk.edu. But either way, regardless, what I am attempting to do is I'm attempting to connect to our intranet, as it says there, our private network that is within this organization that is used to share information and resources among coworkers. There's also an extranet. So imagine that I work for Menards. All right, I'm some kind of a supervisor for Menards. I might have an extranet set up so that if I order out, let, let's say that I order out uh, sinks from Kohler, all right, Kohler Plumbing. So I might have a, a private network between myself and Kohler so that, in other words, I can exchange order information, pricing information, et cetera. All right? So with an extranet, it's a private network, but it's shared among different people. In other words, it's not within the same organization. It's typically an organization and their external partners. Okay? All right, I already mentioned the W3C to you. And the W3C is, again, the World Wide Web Consortium. So if I type in WC3, I'm sorry, W3C.org, that brings up the World Wide Web Consortium. So there's a lot of stuff in here, standards, etc. All right. Notice if I come in here, it looks like it's a Google, but if I, I'm not sure if it will be or not. But I want to type in HTML5. And then notice, here are the specs 
for the H HTML5 protocol, language, whatever you want to call it. All right. So there's all sorts of stuff. The thing to realize is there's the word. This is a very technical website. It's not pretty, but it's very functional. And most of the material that you find on here is unbelievably dry as far as reading. All right. Another thing that you're going to hear a lot about in this class, because it is important, and that's the idea of accessibility. All right. It's literally the law right now that web technologies have to be able to support anyone, whether they're hearing impaired, vision impaired, have some kind of other impairment, or for some reason it's harder for them. They don't access the World Wide Web in, in, the, in the, quote, typical way, unquote. So there's a lot of stuff in this chapter where they start talking about accessibility. One of the key ones is right there, the ADA, the Americans for Disability Act. So like I said, there is just so much information out there. All right. Universal design. It looks like I'm on around page five on the bottom of the book. Universal design, and sometimes it's referred to as UX, it's become a real hot topic. In many ways, it's become hotter than website development and design. Notice what it says here. It's the design of products and environments to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or special, specialized design. So let's put, it, put that into a simple sentence. You want to take the user experience and maximize it. You want to make it as easy for someone to use your site as possible. It should be intuitive. All right. Now they talk about reliability and information on the web on page six and the and seven, and the author asks a couple things. Some questions to ask: Is the organization creditable? Credible. So you evaluate the credibility of the website itself. Does it have its own domain name? Can you look it up on Google? Can you look it up on other sites where people have gone through and done reviews on the site? How recent is the information? In other words, when was it last updated? If you go in there and it's a, it's a site, let's say, on the Olympics, and the last Olympic they have in there is the Olympics of the year 2000, probably not the most up-to-date site. Are there links to additional resources? Is it Wikipedia? Now, that's another important site that you'll learn about during your career at Blackhawk. All right, so if I go out to Wikipedia... Dot org. This is kind of an online encyclopedia. So let's suppose I want to learn more about HTML5. I type in HTML5 and I hit enter. And boom, it gives me information. All right, you can see the contents, and at the bottom there'll be a boatload of resources. All right, you can see that there, there are 41 different resources. In addition, there are five or six different links. Now, the thing you have to be leery of with Wikipedia is if you register on Wikipedia, you can go in and make changes on any of the stuff that's in here. I'm not saying that there'll be those changes will be made permanent, but you can go in and make changes. All right? But it's a great online resource. All right, at the end of each section, the author gives you these little checkpoints, and I'm not going to go over any of them but you could take a look at them if you're interested. All right, most of the rest of the chapter then gives you an overview of some of the hardware stuff. So this is a much better picture of a network than what I tried showing you. Notice that a network is defined as two or more computers connected together. Doesn't have to be a physical connection, but it can be. But they're connected to together so that you can communicate and share resources. A LAN means they're usually are physically connected. We've got a LAN here at Blackhawk on the central campus, another LAN 
at our Monroe campus, another LAN at our Milton campus, and there's also a WAN or a wide area network which allows those computers on those different LANs to communicate with one another. So a LAN is usually confined to a single building or group of buildings, but oftentimes there's a physical connection. A WAN, they're not physically connected. All right, they can serve, as it says, they're widely dispersed geographical areas. The internet infrastructure, as it says there, the backbone is a high capacity communication link that carries data gathered from smaller links that interconnect to it. It's a way for computers to communicate with one another. All right. Now, really, pretty much back in the 80s and 90s, most of this stuff was referred to as the client server model. And what we refer to today as being a browser back in the day was, was referred to as a client. And as mentioned there, a client requests some kind of a service. They may want to file, they might want to access a database, they might want to you know, read something or write something to some place. The server is what tries to fulfill the request and it transmits the results back to the client over some kind of a network. This is what I meant to show you, or tried to show you before. That's the HTTP or Hypertext Transfer Protocol request from the, the client or browser to the server. That's the HTTP or Hypertext Transfer Protocol response from the server back to the client. Again, this is just some more. So web client connected the internet when or as needed. Usually run some kind of browser software. And maybe this is a good enough time to mention this. My strong recommendation is in this class, especially for this class, I would the, the suggestion I'm going to make would be for the entire program here at Blackhawk. But for this class especially, I would recommend that the browser that you use be Google Chrome because Google Chrome supports a lot of things that aren't supported yet in Internet Explorer and in Firefox. So Google Chrome would be my, my number one. Number two would be Firefox. And number three would be then Internet Explorer, which I, you can't, you, as you can see, I don't even show on here. All right, uses the hypertext transfer protocol to request web pages from the server and it receives the web pages and files from a server, so that's the response that it gets back. So the server is always connected to the internet, whereas the client runs browser software, the server runs server software like Apache or IIS. IIS is a Microsoft product. Apache is basically, it's a product that's available and it can be used by anyone on any type of machine. Again, the server, like the client, uses HTTP hypertext transfer protocol, but it gives response. It responds to HTTP requests. Okay. Mention it too to you, just so you hear this, because I'm just trying to throw a little bit of terminology at you right now. You might hear some of this stuff as you go through this class and other classes. You might hear about LAMP, all right, or the LAMP stack. LAMP is an acronym that stands for Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. You take the first letter of each of those and put them together, it spells LAMP. Now, we're not really concerned with the Linux part here. If you've got a Linux machine, you can use it for most of the stuff you do here. But we're more concerned with AMP. We are going to use Apache, MySQL, and PHP. Not so much in this class, but in other classes as you move on in your training here. All right, one of the things that you'll see about internet, the internet, and you'll start seeing this when we, we start going through some simple examples of how to create a web page, is what's called a MIME type. Multi-purpose internet mail extension. M-I-M-E. As it says, it's a set of rules that allow multimedia documents to be exchanged between different types of computers. 
and you'll see the MIME type all over the place. All right. Now, protocol, as you see here, a protocol are protocols are rules that describe methods for clients and servers. They're communication mechanisms. There are more protocols than just HTTP. I've already mentioned that one to you, but there's also FTP. FTP is the file transfer protocol, and that allows you to exchange files between the internet. So sometimes you can go out to, an, to a site in FTP or file transfer protocol files right from an inter, a web server to your machine. Sometimes if you have an account, you're able to go the other way and copy what you're working with over to a server. So as it says, web developers commonly use FTP to transfer web page files from their computers to web servers. So you, you will learn in this class how to create a, you know, simple websites and ideally, by the end of the semester, we'll take that website and we will FTP it over to a server that we have available to us, and then you'll be able to get to your website from your home or from any other computer that has an internet connection, so you'll be able to show people what you've done. So you can use FTP to both upload to a server and, or download from a server. There are email protocols. For sending email, there's SMTP. For receiving email, there's POP, POP3, and IMAP. The HTTP, the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, I've already shown you this. Notice how they say here TCP IP has been adopted as the official communication protocol of the internet. This is the middle of page 11. If you want to learn more about TCP and IP and VoIP and a bunch of those other acronyms. So if you want a more hardware-oriented understanding than you're going to get in this program, I'd strongly suggest that you take a class from our Network Specialist program with Orinda Conway or Denny Wright. All right. A little more on TCP, IP. I'm not going to go through that stuff. This is kind of important. All right. Each device that's connected to the internet has its own unique IP or internet protocol address. And it looks something like this. So the author says, and we're going to try this. So I'm going to grab that information that you see right there. 74.125.225.78. I'm going to go in here into Chrome. I'm going to type that in and hit enter. And you go, nothing happened. That's not true. Let's, let's do this. I'll go to CNN.com first to change where I currently am. Okay, there I'm on CNN.com. All right, now I'm going to put in that number again and hit enter. It says the web page is not available. Someplace, all right, that at least used to be that would map you up to Google. So when you hit enter, it would come back as www.google.com. And as the author says, back in, you know, in the day whenever she wrote this book, you could put that in and it would get you to Google. We'll talk a little bit more about IP addresses as we go on. That when, you know, IP addresses are hard to remember. I mean, come on, 74.125.225.78 as opposed to HTTP colon slash slash either google.com or www.google.com. So what, it, what a DNS is, a domain name system is, and what it does is it converts an IP address like this into a web address like this that's understandable by humans. Good slide here that's shown on page 13 in the book. All right. This whole thing right here is referred to, depending on your point of view, as either a URL, which is a Uniform Resource Locator, or a URI, which is a Uniform Resource Identifier. And really, a URL is a subset of a URI. So if I drew a really big circle on the screen right now, and then in one corner of the circle I wrote URI, then I put another circle inside of it. Inside of that circle, I could put in URL because a URL is a type of URI. So notice, this says the protocol that we're using, the HTTP colon slash slash. The WWW says that it's a World Wide Web document. Web, 
devbasics.net is the do domain name. Chapter 1 is the folder name. And index.html is the actual file name. All right. Now, I want to show you one more thing about this. Oops. I'm going to type in that address that the author has here. HTTP colon slash slash www.webdevbasics.net. I think I spelled dev wrong. Webdevbasics.net. So why am I wasting your time going through this? Hopefully you don't consider it a waste of time. That is the author of your book right there. That's Terry Felk Morris. All right. This is one of her books. And I guess they don't even show the other book. But um, this is basics, basics of Web Design. I probably should have picked this book. With, you know, any book that you have in this program that you like or don't like, uh, it, it's my fault, for lack of better words. I picked them. All right, but what I wanted to show you is webdevbasics.net. That's the author's homepage. If you ever want to go out there and look for anything. All right, top level domain name, bottom of page 13 and going on to page 14. It identifies the rightmost part of the domain name. My email address is jscott at blackhawk.edu. All right, so I'm a .edu. If I go out to Google, it's google.com. You may have gone out to a .org or a .net or a .mil for military or a .gov. The White House, I believe, is whitehouse.gov. Today, many sites use country codes, two-character code. And it was basically, it was intended to give a geographic location. This is that DNS that I mentioned to you before. Again, I don't proclaim at all to be an expert on any of that kind of stuff, but it's something that you can take a look at as you get time and have the interest. All right, I am going to make a little drawing here, and it's going to look a little funky for a second, but again, if you can just bear with me, remove all this. Go back to shapes here, and I'm going to draw a circle. All right. And then I'm going to go and I'm going to draw a couple more circles inside of it. Whoops. I guess it doesn't like that. So let's make it. That's the font color. Change the fill color on that. I thought I could fill. There we go. Now you might say, what the heck are you doing? Well, I'm trying to show you something. If we looked at this big circle on the outside, all right, that big circle on the outside, you'd refer to what's in there as being SGML. That's the standard generalized markup language. That was a language that was developed long, long, long ago. All right? And after that, came up and we, we started to develop and work with HTML, the hypertext markup language. And there were, was version 1, 1.1, 1 .1, 2, 2.1, 2.2, etc., 3, 4, 4.01, and 4.1. And then people said that HTML was getting too hard to use. All right? And HTML itself is made up of about 90 tags, and we're going to start talking about that soon. But people said that the language was too hard to use. So what they did was after coming up with and, and working with HTML, they next decided to work with a language called XML. So if that's HTML, then this would be XML. XML is the extensible markup language. The big difference between HTML and XML is with XML, you make your own tags. Here, the HTML has got a set of predefined tags you use. XML, you make your own tags. Well, XML is still used, 
but it never quite became as popular as a lot of people thought it would be. So people got together again and said, let's come up and let's revise HTML. In other words, let's make it better than it was. And that's kind of how they came up with HTML5. HTML5 is the newest version of HTML. It's still a work in progress. All right. And if you go to Appendix A, which starts in the book on page 619, there is an HTML5 quick reference for a few pages, if you have an interest and in start going out and looking at that kind of stuff. So there's it, it um, SGML, HT, HTML, XML, XHTML, which was kind of a combination of XML and HTML, and then HTML5. All right, popular uses of the internet. This is the end of the chapter on pages 17 through 19. E-commerce, most, most people, or many people buy almost everything they have over the web. All right, they also use the web for things like paying bills, banking, etc. Mobile access, it's now estimated that over 50% of people who use the internet are using a mobile device. In other words, a non-desktop or a non-laptop. So they're either using a tablet or some kind of a phone. Blogs, all right, where people sit there and blog or, or you know, talk about what's going on in their life. Wikis, which are in some ways kind of like a blog, but with a wiki, the idea is anybody can come in here and make changes to them. Social networking. My guess is that most of you listening to this lecture are, have, have a Facebook account. If you are not, if you do not have a LinkedIn account, you really should get one. If you don't know what that is, go up to linkedin.com, L-I-N-K-E-D, linked in, or so I-N.com. All right, RSS for rich site summary. All right, what you can do is you can, you know, what, what um, some places, for example, like CNN.com offers RSS feeds. So if something is going on, let's say you know there, there's a plane crash someplace, and it's in a part of the world where I have relatives, I might want to set up an RSS type of feed so that I'm constantly getting updates on that situation. Podcasts, where typically somebody has an audio cast that they put online. Web 2.0, and there is a, a very good article out there that we'll talk about in a later class. But the idea with Web 2.0 is everything is kind of coming together. All right. The cloud, okay, which is kind of like, you know, to me, what you know, people say, well, what is the cloud? And I say that's basically being able to store everything that you want to store and be able to store it out on the Internet. All right, so out on the net someplace. That's pretty much it for Chapter 1, as it says here. Chapter 1 provided a brief overview of the Internet, Web, and introductory networking concepts. I'm going to continue to slog on here, and I'm going to close this, and next I'm going to go into Chapter 2. All right, I'm going to go through as many of these as I possibly can. And I'm not trying to see how quickly I can go through them, but I want to go through them, and then I'm going to go back and do the actual lab parts.